All right, so the weather, the weather is not perfect, so I'm just gonna, I'll try to uh, finish it as soon as possible. To, tonight, uh, we're gonna conclude with chapter four, so there are only a few small things left from chapter four, which are uh, some, small, some few slides about branch prediction and other techniques, uh, and also uh, exception handling, okay? So the, the rest of the, the slides, uh, which I've uploaded right now, if you downloaded it like a few hours ago, do that again because I've revised some of them. Uh, the rest of the slides you might see on Moodle is uh, for your information. So some information about how we're going to handle um, GEM or general matrix, matrix multiplication, and also some compiler techniques and some ARM related material. So feel free to have a look at those. Um, and also have a look at the, your reference book, chapter four. Okay, starting from next week, we're going to start chapter 5, which is going to be about cache and me memory hierarchy. Uh, and, yeah, I believe we have two more weeks, so we're going to have four lectures on those. And then the last lecture, I'll try to summarize and, uh, you know, do some examples about finance. Any questions before we start? Okay, so you recall in the previous lecture, uh, we were arriving to the point that... Um, we talked about branch prediction, right? How are we gonna ensure that we're gonna lose, we're gonna optimize our pipeline so that we lose the fewer, the fewest possible uh, NOP or no operations, okay, when we stall. And we also talked about the fact that the, the more advanced and deeper pipeline, right, branch prediction would normally get harder and harder to uh, perform and normally, um, if something goes wrong, if you're issuing multiple instructions and in, in a very deep uh, pipeline, you might lose your performance uh, even more than uh, a simple pipeline, okay? So, there are some, um, you know, very simple and more advanced techniques that you're going to have a look at those here. The first one, which is using one bit as a branch predictor. So that's why it's, it's famous for its name. It's a one bit branch predictor. So what it does is we're gonna use a memory contains a bit, right? That says whether the branch was recently taken or not. So, and we go, we go with that uh, prediction depending on the bit that was set to zero or one. And as soon as we hit a missed prediction on the branch, we have to set the bit again the other way around. So if it was zero, it's gonna get to one and the other way, right? So if the hit, if the hint turns out to be wrong, we have to set the branch, right? That means that we have incorrectly predicted um, an outcome of a branch and we have to invert the bit and switch it back. So a hypothetical case would arise, say you have a loop branch that branches nine times in a row, okay? So we are in a loop that does, does it nine times in a row. Using that one bit prediction branch, all right, what is the prediction accuracy for this branch? Assuming the, the, the prediction bit for this branch remains in the prediction buffer, right? So we are using a one bit branch. It has been already set before we start a loop, right? So that we either take it or we don't take it. And then we want to run a loop nine times, okay? How many times we will have a misprediction using a one-bit predictor? What do you think? So think about it this way. So there was a bit here that was set either zero or one, okay? And you enter the branch with either of those two cases. And then you are in a loop that does that nine times, okay? We're gonna come back to that. And then you're gonna exit the loop, right? So not taken, or you come back if it was taken, okay? So we carry on the rest of the code, wherever it was. And that was our one bit predictor, okay? If I wanna run a loop nine times on average, What's going to be the prediction accuracy out of these nine times? Can anyone suggest something? So say um, 
it was set to zero, so not not take the branch. Okay, the first one we need to take the branch, so we pay one penalty, right? One misprediction. Then we have to carry on, right? And then we have to exit the branch. So, how many times do you think we have a misprediction here? Why one? To, to enter the code, right? Yes. To enter, okay. So what's going to happen after we wanted to exit the loop after ninth on the tenth iteration? It's going to change the predictor from one value to another and enter the loop again. Okay. So that's another misprediction. Yeah. So that's going to be two. Okay. But yeah, your 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 colleague was correct. So one. So no matter what the the the. Uh, the one bit was set, right? Once, at least, we need to pay a price, pay a penalty to enter that loop because before that, we weren't having any branch, right? We were just going sequentially. Now, for that branch to enter that loop, we need to pay one penalty, so one misprediction. Then we set our one bit predictor so that we stay in a loop for nine times. After the ninth time, on the tenth time, the predictor tells us, okay, stay in a loop again for the tenth time, which is wrong, right? So we have to again set it back and exit the loop. So in, on average, when you have one bit predictor, right? Uh, here. So you have to pay the price twice, one for entry and, and one for exit. So the steady state prediction uh, will mispredict on the first, right, and the last loop. All right. So two incorrect cases. Was that clear? Why? Why does it misprint on the last one? So because. Consider a loop that branches nine times in a row, right? And then it's is not taken once. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. So that was a very simple form of branch prediction using one bit. Okay. Uh, but you see, on average, in a steady case. Uh, we're gonna use, we're gonna lose two prediction accuracy, so two misprediction. Uh, we can make this a little bit more sophisticated. So why not instead of one bit, we define two bits, so that we can define four states for our branch prediction, right? Let's see how that works. So now, yeah. So so the shortcoming for that was obvious for the for the one bit, one for entering and one for exit. We need to mispredict, right? So let's go for a more sophisticated one, which is a two-bit branch. Now, we can define, with two bits, we can define four states, right? So, we can define it this way, that the two-bit predictor only changes predictions on two successive mispredictions. On the first misprediction, you don't set it again, so that after finishing the loop, you have to set it back, right? So that's why it's, it's going to handle two... In, in this paradigm, we can handle two successive mispredictions. So, set, uh, say it was uh, set as prediction taken, right? So, that, that, was, that was a set for the two-bit predictor. And either we want to take it all the time, so everything is good, we stay here, or that's the first misprediction, which was, it was set to be taken, but we didn't take it, right? So instead of setting it back if it was a one bit, now it's two bits, so we're gonna handle it twice. We're gonna go into this state, which is still predict taken, right? If it's taken again, we're gonna come back here. So we carry on. So only we pay only one price. On the second misprediction, when we are here, so we did it instead of taken and not taken, so we arrive here, and then again, if there is another not, not taken, 
we're going to go to the other side of the word, right? Which is a change of the set here, right? Now it's going to turn from predict taken to not taken now. Okay, now it's going to loop. Then again, for itself, for not taken, if it's not taken again, we are still in not taken word. If it's taken, we're going to go back. So on every two successive misprediction, we have to set it, right? So using a two-bit predictor. So it's going to be more robust on general. We're going to pay the price one time on average, one time fewer. Yeah? Does that make sense? Hello. Did you get the idea? I know you got it, but I'm asking the others. Can someone explain what a two-bit predictor is? Why don't you explain to us? Go ahead. Why? Okay, let's let's go back to one bit. So one bit is just you're using one bit, right? Either zero or one to to predict the outcome of a branch. Okay. Say for instance, think about it, if it was set to one, you always take a branch. If it was set to zero, you always not take a branch, okay? And you just keep following that, that guideline that, that the bit gives you, right? Anytime you have a branch here, for predicting the outcome of that branch, to either go to inner, inner, stay in the inner, or go out and go to the outer, right? So you have a multiple choice. It's a binary choice. Either go there or not. Like, take the branch or not take the branch. Okay, think about it as... 1 and 0 or the other way around doesn't matter okay this is you can represent this with, with one bit okay say you've you've set your predictor to 1 always so every time you arrive here you take it take a look here oh it was 1 so i i need to just take the branch okay so i don't have to wait for cycles in order to stall my pipeline i'm just going to go right away i'm going to take the branch okay however if it turns out that you were wrong, so you were you have mispredicted. So now you understand that this one was incorrect, right? That means that it should have been zero. Mm -hmm. So you set it back to zero now, and then carry on not taking from now on, because the next time you arrive here, you see, oh, my predictor tells me zero, which is not taken. So using this paradigm, we, we were just discussing that um, on a steady state, you pay one misprediction entering the loop, or one misprediction exiting the loop, right? On average. Can we implement something better? Yeah, we, instead of one bit, we can use two bits, right? So instead of two states, now we have four states. And our predictor using two bits can handle now a set on two successive mispredictions. Either those mispredictions could be here, taken, not taken, not taken, or not taken, not taken, 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 okay? So the other way around. Why, 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 why is it taken, taken, and not taken, not taken? It's, it's, it's up to us to define it this way. So we define it, since we have two-bit predictor, we can define four states now, okay? So one not take, taken, one not taken, and then going into these two words, leave us with one error, right? So on two successive misprediction, we switch back and forth between these two words. On, on the first misprediction, we still stay in taken. But on the second mis uh, misprediction, we're going to go to the word of not taken. That's why it's taken. One misprediction for taken is not taken, right? We are still in a taken word, right? This side. But after the second misprediction, which is another not taken, we are on, on the flip side, right? We, want, we will be here. And then we, er, we remain in this space as long as we, our predictor tells us not taken and we are actually not taking it. So we are still here. 
then we have two options, two, uh, two misprediction chance to come back again here. If it was not taken and it was actually should have been taken, so we arrive here, and on the second one, we again flip side and we are on the other side, okay? So this gives us just more flexibility, okay? Was that clear? Yeah. Yeah, so like, over here, one with predictors, we always could do it using one line, right? Like we keep it either default or true. But for two big predictors, the first has two, they always true to go to the next step. Right. So the minimum number of branches two is always true. Minimum misprediction. Minimum misprediction of the branches. If you're writing in the same case, then it has to be like two lines. Right? Uh, two misprediction of the branch, perhaps. Uh, you enter the loop, and you shouldn't have, and then you exited the loop, and you shouldn't have again, right? So it's just it's working only for branches, right? For branch prediction, so either B, Q, or, or other type of branches, right? Later on, we discuss uh, how we can um, add more control into the pipeline. But the idea was when we have more bits to predict, we can define more complex format of you know states. Say if it, if we had three bit predictor, we could have state like uh, up to eight states, right? And then it was up to us as a designer to okay, how how, how am I gonna travel these two words? Am I gonna just take it and then give it three, a third chance to not predict and then go on the other word or fourth perhaps because it's eight, or it's up to us to define it the other way around, right? Okay, so like two predictions should make the entire thing. Yes, here, so two misprediction could be either starting from here, so it was taken, right? But instead of taken that we stay here, we were having not taken. So this is the first misprediction. Now, still we are predict, predict taken, right? And we should have taken it, but again, it turned out that we should not have been taken it. So another, the second misprediction, we are now in, yeah. Straight back to predict taken. Show me supposed to stay in there for at least two times yeah, for two successive times. But if, it, if it's not taken, not taken, taken, it's gonna go back to take. Yeah, always make sure that the last two misprediction will decide, right? If you on the third one, if you still do a misprediction, your last two was a still two misprediction, right? You have to think about it that way, okay. because yeah, got it. Okay, okay. Yeah. Because, so if, yeah, that was a very good question. So if at this point we are in not taken and we should carry on not taking it, right? But if it turns out that we have to take it, so we are arriving back. But if you take a look at it, number three was also false. Number two was also false. Yeah. So it's two, again, two misprediction consequently, right? I mean, these are different ways. These are all optimizations you can define as, as a designer or a computer architect. Some, someone else can just start and you know implement something else, but uh, this is very intuitive to you know think about it. You are using more bits. You can define more sophisticated cases, right, for branches. Um, any questions? Yep. Could you, brief, could you just briefly go through again how does uh, predictor improve the flow? So if you recall, when we were trying to implement the pipeline for branches, so. Here you have instruction fetch ID X mem and write back. Okay, these five stages. So when we are trying to go to the next line for the another ID X mem and write back. Okay, if we wait, so uh, at, at bare minimum, if we don't have any, any optimizations, we have to have three stalls, right? We have to wait from this three stall so that we can go there. But in many of the uh, branch predictions, we can define it at, at ID and go from mem to ID, right? But still, here we need one stall because this one comes, should come here, right? With one nope, this ID will start at this point and then you can forward the result right away, okay? So 
why we are waiting this one stall even with having that uh, forwarding is because we don't know what's going to be the target of the branches, right? Are, are we taking the branch or you're not taking the branch, right? So we are here. We are not sure that our, the, the target branch is inner, which is take the, um, come back here, right? Or is outer, which is getting out of the branch going there, right? So there, there are two choices right here. So because of that, even with the optimization and forwarding, we still need to have one stall. But if you just say, I don't care what the target is, my predictor tell me just take the branch, okay? Right away with no install, you can go for the next one, right? So that's one way to think about it. So what happens if the, the prediction is wrong? Yeah, exactly. So um, after the prediction was wrong, we need to uh, handle the exception that was raised, okay? And we're going to talk about it right now. Yeah, again, so initializing the first one could come from uh, the history of the branch for that processor or history of running that for that specific kernel that was, or the past hour of the history, right? Uh, number of frequencies that was set to run that specific code. So these are all, um, you know, hyperparameters, let's say. You can, you can define it. Could you explain this not taken, taken against? Here? Yeah, no. Here? So we were talking about two successive mispredictions, right? So if we are here, that means that either we have a misprediction starting from here, going there, so it's one already, or we were here or here either way to arrive here with one misprediction, or if we arrive here with two hops, it's two mispredictions, okay? So no matter what, we are here. So at best, we already had one misprediction, okay? If we here predict not taken and then we take it, another misprediction, at best we're gonna have two mispredictions, right? That's why we are again switching side. Is that what, like, how is that taken? How is that a misprediction? How is taken misprediction? So think about a branch that you need to take it, so it's staying a branch, it's staying a loop, but the loop was over. The iterator was the last one. It was i um, smaller than 20, and that was the i's 20s one. So you had to leave the loop. Is that the case here? So instead of taking it, we're not taking it. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. If you want, if you want to not taking it, it would be like you thought you're outside the branch. Way you're meant to take the branch. Yeah. So either way. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, even with even with that two predictor, right? Normally we need to have one cycle penalty on average for many cases, and there are so many ways how to handle this. So now let's talk about exception and interrupts. So just like any high-level programming languages in like Java, C++, you need to define uh, undefined behaviors, right? When something goes wrong, you need to make sure that you've already defined that, uh, you know, wrong status. So when you're writing a code, if there was a, um, an incorrect input or something went wrong inside a calculation, you just your code doesn't have to crash right away. You have to find a way that you try this specific thing. If these things happen, this is the way I'm gonna handle this, right? Um, just think about when you are in an in an ATM machine, you want to fetch some money, right? And then it was running out of money. So this is one exception that should be handled by the program inside the ATM, right? So one way is just, you can, you can see on the screen that the system crashed and then you see a bunch of hex codes, <laughs> which is not secure in an ATM machine, right? You just wanted to get some money and then you all see blue screens and crash. Or the other way is like the programmer was handling that, the exception and it's gonna just print out, we don't have money, right? Come back later. So this is one way to handle that exception that happened in, in the code. So coming with, that, with this analogy, going into the hardware, 
<clears throat> at pipeline level, you need to make sure that if something went wrong, you need to handle that exception as well. There was a question? Yeah. yeah. Um, so parameters are supposed to make it faster, right? <laughs> yes. So it's supposed to make the flow smoother, like at the pipeline, right? Yeah. Like, we are trying to improve the CPI. Yeah, yeah. but um, if it causes like, or, like, and, like causes the slowdown, does it like, leave the purpose of it? Yes. So like, why are we doing it? But if so, if it slows down every time, that means that you have mispredictions every time. It's like you have it, you have no prediction at all, right? It doesn't slow you down. It just doesn't improve you. Yeah, perhaps by slowing down, you're spending a little bit more power to to use that function in, inside that control module. Perhaps one tenth of one watt per iteration. Yeah, in that case, you're wasting energy, right? Yeah. But every time it works, it, it's going to save you some stalls, some no operations, right? Do we need to, like have history of as well, right? Yeah. Based on like how the prediction works. Yeah, branch history table, yeah. So that previous like predictor scheme that we had was just a sample or an example of what a predictor? Yes, well, yeah, because more sophisticated predictors are doing so, so, so much other things, yeah. yeah. All right, so now we have to understand how we're going to uh, handle the exceptions. Let's have a look at the C++ example of a code, right? So when you write code, one way is just you write your code and then if this one, this input was in this range, just do this, okay? But the other way is, more professionally, let's say, is in C++ you can um, encapsulate all that uh, segment that you want to try to handle the exception in a try, in a try and your and a catch, right? Segment. So this is the try. This is the catch. So instead of just writing it, if x was smaller than zero, see out this, which is print, which is print in C plus plus, right? What if this one was failed, right? If this one failed, you just have some blue screens and some code, yeah, this, uh, this thing failed at runtime. But when you do encapsulate that inside a try and catch, is like try this, if it failed, catch the failure and do this. Okay, this is the way we, accept, we handle exceptions in, in C++. For Java, it would be the same. Uh, so for instance here, we say try this segment if x was smaller than zero, right? Throw x, which is get the exception and then handle it the way I want, which is in my catch segment. Okay? So that's why when it's when it's arriving here and this condition wasn't met, it's not gonna carry on running this code, which is this C out. Okay? It's just gonna go on the throw, and the throw is handled by catch, right? If I wasn't encapsulating these two in try and catch, at this point when when I was trying to say if x was smaller than x, uh, zero, it wouldn't just run the rest of the code and we were having uh, some crash code okay, on the screen. But now we can handle it the way we want. Instead of just uh, those you know error issues, error problems, we're gonna just write whatever we want here, right? Or we can print the code of the, the crash depending on the information that compiler or the hardware provides us. Like error code 121, do this. Yeah. So C out in, in C is, is print. Okay. Output on the screen, yeah. So print the or print F in C. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yes, so, so it's going to print this screen. Yeah, that's right. And this. A slash and is like going to the next line. Yeah. All right. So if I run this, what do you think the output is? And you know that the the x that I input deliberately is minus, right? Exception caught. Exception caught. Okay. And then. Okay. Okay. So this is the output, right? 
So we're going to arrive up to here before something went wrong. So before try is going to be printed, right? We start here. This will print. And then we're going to go into the try, right? This is still printing. We are good. This where the problematic part was, right? The code will fail and we throw that exception and we're going to catch it, right? So just think about um, as um, like a football, right? You want to throw something and then somebody else has to catch the, the, uh, the exception. So that's why this never, this will be never printed, okay? So after throwing the exception, we're going to catch it with this C out and then we'll write it down here, okay? So that's the way to uh, handle an exception, okay? It's in C++, it's in high level language. So let's see, the same concept will be happening underneath, so in, in lower level in, in your ICE A, right, in RISC-V. Yep. Can I predict eventually, like, uh, replace the branch completely? Like, if you have two branches in like, given our history, we can tell that one is like coming wrong over and over and giving an error. So can we just get rid of it completely to make our program get faster? I mean, perhaps a sophisticated one might do that, yeah. They might call it a speculative branch, yeah. Or, or recent compilers are able to do that when they're compiling the code. They understand that how many times, if, if you don't issue your iterator at runtime, right, which is unknown at compile time, yeah, it's, it's, it's doable for a compiler. Yeah. So, uh, the do and catch operations, yeah. mm. does, does like the code branch out whenever it sees through and it looks for whatever, it looks for catch, mm -hmm. it's going down, it's yeah. sees catch. Yeah, exactly. So, are you saying that like, um, they don't exist without the other ones? Yeah. Are they, are they the, uh, and then no catch. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you just write throw and no catch, mm -hmm. your code will crash and you don't see any output. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Don't see any output. What about yeah, because the, we didn't catch it, right? What about the the like print statements that came before through? So up to here, so let me just clear this thing. So up to here, everything was fine. Up to here. So before try and yeah, these two will still print. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So now, let's see how we're going to handle exception in RISC-V. Just like that throw and catch um, paradigm, we have two more registers we can define and add it to our pipeline, which is called SEPC, so SEPC, and then S cause. Okay, the first one is supervisor exception program counter. It's a 64 register holds the address of the affecting instruction. So right away when it was, um, you know, crashing or the exception was happening, or and then we need to make sure that when we throw to a handler, we know where exactly it was crashed, right? And then the other one is as cause, which is supervisor exception cause register, which holds a field that indicates the reason for the exception. So perhaps we want to use that in order to later on print it on the screen or just give some hints to the to, um, to the user that this this happened because of that, right? This code was the, the error code. So these two can be used, all right? And there is another one which is a jump instruction to handler. So this is this is exactly our catch here. When something happened, we understand where it was happening, what was the reason, and then what to do next, right? So in this case, we, we are just telling that the, the program counter just start executing at this address, right? We don't want to crash and then do nothing. After something happened, we want to handle that exception and then carry on executing from that address that is in handler, okay? So let's see how we're going to do that. So 
for instance, for the reason of uh, exception, we can define, for instance, two reasons here. This one represents an undi uh, un uh, undefined opcode, right, with this value. We can just print that error as, as the error code. And the other one might be just hardware malfunction, right? Use this value for that. You could have used other things because you have 64 bits. You could have defined many, many, many other error handling. But you decided just to use these two for now, okay? And then <clears throat> we need to decide if you want to deal with the interrupt or jump to a real handler, okay? So now, what's going to be the, the high level task that needs to be done? For handler action. So first of all, we need to read the cause that was that was thrown to handler. Okay. And then we need to determine the action. So either we have to restart executing some operations, or we just have to terminate the program, depending on the, the way it was defined. Okay. If you wanted to restart, we need to use the first register that I described to return to the program because this register contained the code of the crash line. So that means that up to that point, everything was good. So now we have to carry, if you want to restart, we have to come back to that point and then restart the execution. Or if you, if you decided to terminate the program, right, we need to just report the error using the error code that we define here, for instance, undefined opcode with this or hardware malfunction with that code, right? And then terminate the program. So these are two different ways that handler will handle, okay? Okay. So if you want to implement it in the pipeline, it's going to be treated as another form of control hazard because it's within the, the scope of control. So Let's talk about executing this. We want to add x1 with something and again to x1. So definitely we're going to have an exception here, right? It's, it's, so it's a form of control hazard. And then we want to make sure that we don't cut the, the operations for x1, right? And more importantly, when we are in a pipeline, right, when we are, for instance, in a stage of MEM, remember that the other stages are running with else, with other, you know, opcodes, right, with other operations. So if we terminate it right away, we have to make sure that these are completed, right, because we failed right here. But this needs to be done and completed. That specific lines that were already in the pipeline needs to be completed. So this is a very important task for defining that exception handler. We need to make sure that the other instructions are completed. Okay. All right. And then, of course, we need to flush the add, which is we removed it from the, the, the program counter. And then the subsequent instruction should be done either by handler to restart or terminate. Okay. All right, let's see how we're going to do that on pipeline. So now, in order to implement that, here, I have added a, an addition right here, which is the handler address, right? I'm going to input it as another input to the, mul uh, to the multiplexer. So this is the code of the handler that when exception was found, the handler should start going to this address, OK? This is the supply of the new PC because remember this this one was the adder for the PC so at every iteration it was adding plus four plus four and then running the, the everything on the pipeline. Now if an exception was uh, catched and thrown here the handler should fit this address to the program counter so that it is going to take over the control of the next set of lines right in your pipeline. Okay the other thing that we added are these two registers so it's cause and SEPC which was containing the error of the the, the reason for the cause of the exception and also uh, the specific address 
that the exception occurred. Okay. And what else we added? So now we, we let's let's have a look at an example that how we're gonna fit this handler uh, address when an exception happens. Okay. Any questions so far? All right, so on a case of restartable exceptions, if we decided to restart that operation that failed, the pipeline can flush the instruction, and then the handler with the address that we already set it executes, then return to the instruction, right? And the program counter. Uh, that saved in that specific instruction that failed is going to identify the cause of the instruction. For instance, we were running this code, right? These are the address, so plus four, plus four, plus four, and here we're going to have an exception, right, for the add, for the add because it's add x1, x2, to x1, right? So we're going to have an issue. We've already provided the address for the handler so that if something went wrong when, when, we, when we caught the, the exception the handler should start executing from this address okay onward okay so let's see what's gonna happen now we have filled the pipeline um, let's see where we were and load. so the pipeline is full, you see the exception is happening here at the X to mem stage, but the rest of the pipeline was occupied with other right operations in their different respective stages. Okay, so now this the exception is detected during the X stage of clock six. Can anyone this uh, mention Y clock six? This is a simplified version. Yeah, that's too many lines. Like, it's, uh, it was it was much easier to understand the that the coding codes. Yeah. But you know this this sophisticated the pipeline only does a just simple jobs like add and that's all yeah, like, it's pipelining. What's it all the multiplexers and so which of them? What do they do? So you so in, in chapter four we gradually started to build this pipeline, right? So yeah, uh, we can talk about it offline. Okay. Close enough. So like the first, the first, let's say clock one mm -hmm. is the sub, mm -hmm. and the clock two. Exactly. Goes to and clock three is four, and clock four begins uh, like clock four step. It's the IF stage for add, and then clock five will be the IV stage, and then clock six will be the X. Exactly. Everyone got the idea. So. I was asking why we have this, the, the exception happening at the sixth clock number six. And your colleague was correctly answering this because remember we had a pipeline of five. So IF, ID, X, MEM, I'm right back, okay? And this goes 
for each of those instructions, right? <coughs> so this one, you carry on filling up the pipeline with the sub. On a second iteration, you add this, and on a third one, on the fourth one, you input add. So add would be in this if stage, right? By the clock number six, add would be in its X stage when this, the exception happens. Got it? So that's why when you see this, add is here at X stage because it has already done the, its first two stage and it was on the fourth line. So it had to wait three times more. So adding those is going to be six. So the, the exception will happen at clock number six. Okay? Now, so we detect this, uh, the exception at uh, number six at the X stage, right? So at this point, we need to save the address of the add instruction to the CEPC register, okay? So the address would be 4C uh, hex. Okay, here. That's the 4C address, okay? So we're going to use CEPC these two, um, this register to hold the address at the time that the exception happened, okay? Now, this exception causes to flush the signals, right, to be set near the end of the, the clock cycle, and we have to uh, do the assertion again, right, so that we have to set them zero for the add, okay? Now, on the next cycle, we need to understand where and how many bubbles or no operations or stalls we are giving to the program. And also making sure that the other uh, instructions that we're running keep finishing their task, okay? So at clock cycle uh, seven, um, we're gonna run the routine that was meant to be run by the handler because we've already passed it here. Okay, which is this. If something went wrong, flush the memory, stop here, save the address, and go what the handler tells you. And it's going to tell us, okay, run this. Okay. So we failed that here. We finished the others. And then we do the nops. So no operations. And go here. So this will fit the address, the program counter, and it's going to start IF stage of the instruction that was meant to be run by the handler. Okay? All good? Why do you need to restore it? Why do you need to store it? No, because we, we defined it here. It's, it, it was up to us. Right? That was That was the... That was the instruction we fit we fit to the handler, right? Yeah, just like this here, we were handling the way we want it, right? Yeah, but it feels like what's the purpose of it? It's supposed to get feedback to show that there's an error. What does store accomplish? So perhaps at this address, thousand address of the X10, there was um, perhaps the error code, or I mean, it could have been anything. Like, oh, it's yeah. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. It could have been anything, yeah. All right. So this is a pretty simple example of how we're going to handle exceptions in a lower, lower level uh, in, in a ISA of your processor, okay? There are so many other ways to handle exceptions. What if uh, we were, you know, having a multiple stage pipeline and we were facing multiple exceptions at the same time? And how are we going to handle those? There are so many other techniques that are in, in, in the latter stage of Chapter 4, which are a little bit outside the scope of our course. But please feel free to have a look at those if you're interested. It's going to help you just to widen your um, thought about computers in general and architecture. The, the last thing that remains is there is this notion of instruction level parallelism. You might have heard about the word ILP, and which is... Uh, using a pipeline that has multiple uh, issue, right, per cycle. 
So if you have multiple issues per cycle, normally you are able to decrease your CPI to lower than one, right? So at best, you're going to have multiple issues per cycle. So and this is the way that the, the modern CPUs are normally working. So they are capable of doing it in ILP. And this itself arises so many other issues. But the, the last thing I'm just going to mention is something called speculation is, is just similar to prediction that a compiler does, right? <clears throat> or in conjunction with the hardware. And that's why it is called compiler slash hardware speculation. So first of all, because they are compiling the code, they can reorder it at the same time when they're generating the binary. So this is one, one task. Because it's, it is exp, uh, speculating that if I run it this way, I'm going to just avoid some expect, uh, exception. Okay? At the same time, it can um, fix up or recover some incorrect guesses at compile time. Okay? Um, and this can be done also in static and dynamic, which are uh, outside the scope of the course. All right, so I guess we, we are almost done with the chapter four. The rest of them are just other more recent techniques of scheduling and then running unrolling techniques um, and perhaps gem at the end. Yeah, multi, multi, multiply. So feel free to have a look at these stuff. They are very insightful for your um, knowledge, I would say. But you're not going to um, ask questions on your final. All right, any questions uh, from chapter four? OK, so we'll start chapter five, which is caches and memory hierarchy on Monday. OK, have a good night, guys.